This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More on them at the end. We all take different paths in life. Some of us take the straight one. Go to school, go to college, get a job, have a couple of ungrateful kids, and then die. And some of us go round and round and round without any idea where we're going, just to end up in the exact same place we started. But even when we do, sometimes we learn something along the way. The journey mattered more than the destination. And sometimes it doesn't. The destination was all that mattered in the first place. And that, my friends, is precisely what the fundamental theorem of line integrals tells us- Wait, 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 wait. Don't spoil it yet. They need to watch the rest of the video. Right. Sorry. In my previous video, I introduced the concept of a line integral and showed you how to evaluate them for a regular function. Until now, it just seems like line integrals are a cool generalization of regular integration into higher dimensions. However, they're a lot more important than just that. And to explain why, we need to talk about line integrals over vector fields and build up to an incredible new idea, the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So, let's get into it. Going into this video, I'm going to assume you have a basic idea of the following concepts. Vector fields, vector valued functions, gradients, and line integrals of 3D curves. If you need a refresher on any of these, I would suggest looking at my previous two videos, where I introduce vector fields and gradients and also talk about line integrals at a more fundamental level. We'll start by looking at how we can take a line integral over a vector field. Then, later in the video, we'll discuss the fundamental theorem of line integrals, which connects regular functions and vector fields in a really profound way. But before we can get there, let's quickly review the difference between regular functions, vector valued functions, and vector fields, because we're going to see all three of them in this video. Let's look at the 2D case. What I would call a regular function in 2D can be generally written as y equals f of x. On the right hand side, we have some expression of an input variable x, which is equal to our output variable y. This function can be represented by a line in 2D space. By comparison, vector valued functions in 2D still graph lines, but are written as r of t equals x of t i hat plus y of t j hat where i hat and j hat represent unit vectors in the x and y directions, respectively. It's nice to think about vector value functions as outputting a vector from the origin to each point in space along a curve, which is why you'll often see this unit vector notation. The variable t here is called a parameter. Effectively, this 2D vector valued function has a 1D input space and a 2D vector output. Notably, a VVF with only one input parameter can only draw a 1D curve, no matter if it exists in 2D, 3D, 4D, or n-dimensional space. Now, vector fields, rather than outputting vectors that point to points on a curve, they output vectors to points in space. Let me clarify with a picture. Here's a vector field in 2D space. Notice that we're no longer drawing a curve. And here's how you write the equation for a 2D vector field. Notice that we have arbitrary functions of x and y, which are denoted here as p and q, which are multiplied by i hat and j hat unit vectors. Except now, these vectors don't start at the origin, but at their input point, x comma y. Effectively, this 2D vector field has a 2D input space and a 2D output space. Okay. Now that we've clarified the difference between these three types of functions, let's talk about calculating line integrals over vector fields. I'm going to explain this initially in an abstract sense, and then we'll contextualize it later down the line. To simplify things, let's work with a 2D vector field, which I'll call f of x comma y. Since we have a vector field in 2D space, our integrating curve C should also live in 2D space. Let's start by parameterizing our integrating curve to make it a vector-valued function. r of t equals x of t i hat plus y of t j hat. 
to really understand what it means to take the line integral of a vector field, we'll work backwards from the formula for a line integral of a regular function. Here it is. We derived it completely in my previous video. In the integrand, we have our multivariable function f multiplied by the magnitude of the derivative of our parameterized integrating curve times a tiny change in our parameter t, dt. The bounds of this integral, t0 and t final, are the values of t that correspond to the start and end points of our integrating curve. Now, what if we just switch the regular function f in this formula with our vector field, uppercase f? Well, then we end up with this, a vector field multiplied by the magnitude of a vector valued function, which is a regular scalar function. But that doesn't quite work. We need our line integral to equal a single scalar value, and multiplying a vector by a scalar gives a vector. Since we have two vectors in this integrand, the vector field f and the vector value function, r prime of t, we can use a different operation, the dot product. So let's just take the dot product of these two, and bam! This turns out to be the correct formula for the line integral of a curve over a vector field. Okay, wait, but there's no way you're stopping there. I mean, this explanation has so many loose ends. What's a dot product? Why does it make sense to use one here? And didn't you say that vector-valued functions draw 1D curves? Well, how is it that this vector-valued function is now just a vector itself? All valid questions. Let's tackle them one by one. First off, what's a dot product? Well, as many of you might know, a dot product is a way of multiplying two vectors to get a scalar. You take their components, multiply them element-wise, and then add up all those products. That's great, but what does that represent? Well, the dot product of two vectors tells you how much of one vector points in the direction of another. Let's look at a simple example. The vector i hat, or 1 comma 0, which we'll call a, and the vector 2i hat plus 3j hat, or 2 comma 3, which we'll call b. If we take the dot product of these two vectors, we get 2. This tells us that the amount of vector b that goes in the direction of vector a, and vice versa, is 2. Now, this is a bit of an incomplete picture. The real operation that tells us how much of one vector goes in the direction of another is the projection, which involves the dot product, but also requires us to divide by the magnitude of our first vector. However, for our purposes, it's important that we don't divide by the magnitude of a first vector, and we'll see why right now. Let's go back to our line integral. At every point along our integrating curve, we can draw a tangent line corresponding to the derivative at that point. Alternatively, we can also draw a tangent vector representing the same tangent line, which now also notes the direction of movement of our curve, and its magnitude is equal to the slope of the tangent line. This is actually the derivative of our vector value function. The dot product of our vector field and this tangent derivative tells us how much of our vector field is going in the direction of our integrating curve. And if we add up all of those values, we get the total line integral. And that's why it's also important we don't divide by the magnitude of our tangent vector. Its magnitude tells us the size of the curve's derivative at a given point. And if the derivative is greater, you would want it to contribute a greater amount to our total line integral. Okay, but hold on. You said that this tangent vector is the derivative of our vector valued function, but the derivative of our vector valued function should itself still be another vector valued function. Vector valued functions output a set of vectors that start at the origin, but now these vectors are starting at points along the original curve? What's up with that? That's a great question. While it's true that the derivative of a VVF is still a VVF, at least when we write it out, conceptually, it means something a little bit different. Let's think carefully about what the derivative of a VVF is telling us. To demonstrate, we'll use the curve y equals square root of x, which we can parameterize as r of t equals ti hat plus square root t j hat. 
at the point t equals 1, our VVF draws a vector pointing to the point 1, 1, and that vector is i hat plus j hat. Now let's move to the point t equals 1 plus dt, where dt is very, very small. So we move a very small step along this curve. We got to this new point by drawing a new, slightly different vector from the origin. Now, what does the derivative of the VVF tell us? It tells us how much this vector changes when we go from 1 to 1 plus dt. We can actually represent that by the difference between these two vectors, which is itself a vector. As dt approaches 0, this difference vector becomes a vector tangent to the curve at t equals 1. So while it is true that if I take the derivative of this VVF, I'll get r of t equals i hat plus 1 over 2 times square root of tj hat, which I can graph as its own curve, what makes intuitive sense is to move these vectors that start at the origin to start at the point on the curve which they represent the derivative of. Now, this intuitive explanation is slightly inaccurate r prime of t doesn't actually give us the tangent vector. dr ds does, where ds is an infinitesimal step along the integrating curve. And so the correct way to write this integral would be like so. Integral of f dot dr ds ds. However, we can easily see with the chain rule that this is equal to the original integral we derived earlier. ds can be written as ds over dt times dt, and we end up with dr dt dt, which is equivalent to r prime of t dt. Great. So now we know how to find a line integral over a curve c for a vector field f. Note that this expression generalizes to any number of dimensions, since r prime of t can exist in any number of dimensions as well. The only requirement is that the integrating curve exists in the same dimensional space as our vector field. Now that we have the relevant background, we can start talking about the fundamental theorem of line integrals, the culmination of this video. Instead of immediately spoiling it for you, let's build up to it. Consider a line integral over the 2D vector field, f of x comma y equals 2x i hat plus 2y j hat. Let's draw an integrating curve. But this time, let's make it so that the curve starts and ends at the same point. Let's use a circle of radius 1 going in the counterclockwise direction for our curve. We can parameterize this as r of t equals cosine t i hat plus sine t j hat. It's just the unit circle. Our starting point would be at t equals 0, and our ending point would be at t equals 2 pi. As a side note, we would call this a closed line integral, and denote it with this little circle on the integration symbol. So let's calculate it. Interestingly, we end up with a zero. Intuitively, you might think this actually makes sense. Our integrating curve starts and ends at the same point, so it doesn't move us anywhere through the vector field. So of course the line integral will be zero. But this doesn't actually capture the whole picture. The line integral over this curve isn't going to be zero for every possible vector field. As a counterexample, Consider f of x comma y equals minus y i hat plus x j hat. If we take the line integral of this vector field over our same unit circle curve, we end up with a non-zero value. It turns out, the fact that the line integral of our first vector field ended up being zero also has to do with the vector field that we chose. It's special. Specifically, this vector field just so happens to be a gradient field, sometimes also called a conservative vector field. In other words, this vector field is also the gradient of some regular function. What function is that? Well, we can do some math to figure it out. Remember that the gradient is just a vector concatenation of the partial derivatives of a regular scalar function. Since this gradient is 2D, our function must have a 2D input space, or two input variables x and y. The i hat component is df dx, while the j hat component is df dy. Integrating these two differential equations, 
we can see that the i hat component tells us that our regular function f must be equal to x squared plus some function of y. The j hat component tells us that f must be y squared plus some function of x. These two notions are compatible, meaning that a regular function is just x squared plus y squared. You can verify yourself that the gradient of this function is 2x i hat plus 2y j hat. In fact, it's the same example I used in one of my previous videos to introduce gradients in the first place. By contrast, the other vector field we wrote, minus y comma x, is not a gradient field, and we can see why. Its i hat component tells us that the regular function needs to be minus x times y plus some function of y, while the j hat component tells us it's positive x times y plus some function of x. There's no way to make these two functions equal to each other, meaning that the vector field is not the gradient of some other regular function. One important note is that sometimes the line integral over a closed curve being zero may just be a coincidence. Just because that's the case for one closed curve over a vector field doesn't mean the vector field is conservative because the theorem states that conservative vector fields have a line integral of zero over every closed curve. The connection is even more general than this. The fundamental theorem of line integrals tells us that the line integral of a vector field over any curve, regardless of if it is closed or not, is equal to the regular function corresponding to our gradient vector field evaluated at the start and endpoints of our integrating curve. Now, that was a mouthful, but we can see it's actually very similar to the fundamental theorem of 1D calculus. In single variable or 1D calculus, the integral of the derivative of f is equal to the difference between the value of f at the integration bounds. In multivariable calculus, the line integral of the gradient of f is equal to the difference between the value of f at the bounds of the integrating curve. We can see again how now the fundamental theorem of line integrals is really just an extension of the fundamental theorem in single variable calculus into higher dimensions. The last step to sum this video up would be to formally prove the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And that I'll leave to you guys to try for yourselves. It's actually a relatively simple proof. You can start by expanding the gradient into its i hat, j hat, and k hat components. I'll leave the rest to you. Watching YouTube videos is a great way to learn math, but I believe the best way is to practice by messing with the formulas yourself. Speaking of practice, if you want even more exercises to strengthen your skills with line integrals, gradients, or really any area of math or science, I highly recommend today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online platform where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and now even AI. Brilliant's uniquely designed platform combines first principles approaches with interactive lessons that make learning both effective and fun. While you're building knowledge on specific topics, Brilliant teaches you to think critically, tackle challenges, and break down complex ideas. All skills you'll use well outside of just academics. One of my favorite courses on Brilliant is their course on vectors. This course helps you visualize vectors in 2D and 3D, making abstract concepts much easier to grasp. And that's true for so many of the other math courses Brilliant offers, from more foundational topics like solving equations and functions, all the way to advanced topics like vector calculus and linear algebra. So sign up today at brilliant.org slash foolishchemist and try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days. You'll also get 20% off their annual premium subscription by using this link. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.